Hello and welcome back to Measure Theory. This is part 4 in our series and today I will finally explain you why we can't define the Lebesgue measure on the whole power set. And this should give you at least one motivation why it's so important to study the Measure Theory. For the start here let me state the measure problem again. We search a measure mu on the power set of R. So as you can see, this is the one dimensional case. So we first deal with the real number line before we go to higher dimensions. We call this the measure problem because we want now two natural properties that are fulfilled by this measure mu. First, the measure of a normal interval should be just the length of this interval. Hence just b minus a, where I say that b is of course larger than a. Of course this is what we want, we want to generalize the measuring of lengths. And now the second natural property is that we have something we call translation invariance. This means that if we have a set a and shift that by a fixed vector x, we don't change the length or the measure of the set. This means that we get out mu of a on the right hand side here. And there you have it, that is what we call our measure problem. And such a measure mu would truly generalize the length measure of intervals. However, for more than 100 years it is known that this measure problem is not solvable. So we can't define such a measure mu on the whole power set on R. Therefore it makes sense to build the whole measure theory with sigma algebras. In the end we will see that we can choose a suitable sigma algebra where we indeed can solve this measure problem. However in this video I start by proving that the measure problem on the power set does not have a solution. The claim I will prove now is the following. Let mu be a measure on the power set with the property 1 and 2 but I will weaken the property 1 a little bit. I just want that the measure of the unit interval is finite, so not infinity. This is of course fulfilled when property 1 is fulfilled. And why I excluded 0 in this interval here you will see later. In addition mu should now also fulfill property 2, which means it is translation invariant. The result is now that there is only one measure that satisfies this. And this is the zero measure. And of course the trivial measure is not what we want. The trivial measure does not fulfill property 1 in our measure problem. So this explains this implication here. The whole video is now about proving this claim. And indeed this is a typical exercise you find in measure theory lectures. Therefore I strongly advise you to try for yourself and then maybe fill in the details by using this video. And of course if you're not interested in technical details you can happily skip this video and go to the next one in the series. For everyone else now comes the proof. I will structure it a little bit so I start with A by giving some definitions. We will study the interval where we know that the measure is finite, so this is what I call capital I. Which means the unit interval where I exclude the 0 and include the 1. And on I I now define an equivalence relation. And this equivalence relation should ignore rational numbers inside the interval. Which means I define x and y as equivalent if and only if the following holds. The difference between both of them is only a rational number. So x minus y is in Q. This means that we don't want to distinguish numbers that only differ by a rational number. We want to deal with these numbers as the same. Therefore the equivalence class of such an x can be written as x plus all rational numbers r. So we put all these numbers in one box and call it the x with the brackets. 
However, keep in mind, we define the equivalence relation on our set i. So now we just live on the unit interval. Therefore, these numbers should also live on the unit interval. Therefore, I have to add here that also x plus r lies still in the unit interval. So I can't add a big rational numbers because then I would leave the unit interval. Yeah, otherwise, now we hit all the numbers we want. There we have the well-defined equivalence relation with the well-defined equivalence classes. To give some visualization, I may draw these boxes for real. They are sets, sets with elements, so I could call this x1 and have one box here. Then I have another one, so this would be x2, x3 and x4, and of course this picture goes on for forever. We don't know if we have countable many boxes as the picture suggests here, so please be careful, but we know that we have a disjoint decomposition of the unit interval. This is what we always have if we define an equivalence relation. Now we already reached the essential part of the proof, because we define a set A in I that describes all these boxes. That means each element A describes or represents exactly one of these boxes. In this picture it would look like, okay, I choose one element here, maybe I call this A1, then I go to the next box, I pick an element A2, here I pick out an element A3, here A4, and so on, and then I put all these elements in a set. And this is what I call the set A. This looks nice now, but keep in mind, if we have uncountable many boxes, this picture is not the correct way to represent this, and therefore we need another definition for our set A. But of course, with exactly the same idea behind. The first property is therefore for each box, so for each equivalence class X, I find such an A in A. This just means picking out an element A out of the box. And then the second property should tell us that this element is unique, so I only choose one element of each box. So for all A, B and A, we have the property that A and B come out of the same box, X. We can imply that A is equal to B. Hence the definition tells us that the set A has exactly one representative out of each box. The equivalence classes are therefore exactly represented by the set A. However, it's not clear how to do this representation. You don't find in construction how we can find the set A. It looks very nice in the picture, and there you might see we have a lot of possibilities to define such a set A. But keep in mind, if we are in the uncountable picture, we might not know if such a set A could exist. And indeed, the justification is very strong here. What we need here is indeed the axiom of choice that is given in the set theory. Therefore, it's an axiom that guarantees the existence of such a set A with exactly these two properties. Okay, that was a lot, but we are still not finished with all the definitions I want to give. Now we have fixed the set A, and now I want to shift it a little bit. So I translate it by a rational number. So this is what I define as AN. So this would be RN plus the set A. And RN is a rational number. More concretely, I want a sequence RN. So this goes over the natural numbers that enumerate the whole rational numbers. That's not completely correct. I just want an enumeration of the rational numbers intersected with the yeah, real interval minus one till one. And of course, why I want that, you will see later. <laughs> However, you should see that we can use that the rational numbers are countable when we want to apply the sigma additivity later. And now we can finally go over to part B of my proof. 
First we show here that the sets I here defined are indeed disjoint. So we have AN intersected with AM and this gives you the empty set if N is not equal to M. The proof works easily by contraposition. This means you could read this one here as an implication. So if N is unequal M, this applies that this sets are disjoint. Now contraposition now means, okay, they are not disjoint and this applies N equals M. So this is logically equivalent. However, not being disjoint means there is an element we can choose out of this intersection. So this is what we do. And this implies immediately two properties. Being in a n means I can write x as r n plus some, you know, the lowercase a in a, so I have an a here. Or being in a m means I can write it as r m plus some a. But of course, these could be two different a's, so I also give here an index to say this. Okay, but of course, the x is the same on the left, so I can equal them. This means that I have rn plus an equals to, to rm plus am. And there you see what I can do is yeah, put all the a's on the one side and all the r's on the other side. And now on the right, we subtract two rational numbers, so you know what comes out is also a rational number. Now, remind yourself that we defined an equivalence relation exactly when the difference of two numbers is a rational number. Yeah, so in other words, a n and a m are now equivalent. Or to put this in other words, we could also say our a n is in the equivalence class represented by a m. If you want, you could also now add a m here as well. So of course, a m is also in the equivalence class here. And then you see we have property two for our set a. And it tells you if two elements come out of the same box or the same equivalence class, they have to be the same. So the conclusion here is a n is equal to a m. Okay, so this tells us the left hand side here is zero, but then also the right hand side is zero. And therefore we can again imply that also the rational numbers here are the same. So Rn is equal to Rm. But the Rn's were chosen as an enumeration of the rational numbers. And therefore here also the indices have to coincide. And this proves now the claim by contraposition. Very good. Now I want to go over to the next part. In part C, I want to look at the union of these disjoint sets. So I have here union n over n. Okay, now keep in mind what the definition of a n was. That was defined by our set a that lives in the unit interval, shifted by rational numbers that live in minus one to one. This means by using the union, I still should not be able to leave the interval that is given by minus one. And now I shift one with maximum one. So here I have two. And on the other side, you can use how we defined A. So this was representation of all the equivalence classes and where the equivalence classes were defined by the differences with the rational numbers. And now I add back all the rational numbers. So I should get at least the unit interval out again. Okay, so this one is the claim we should prove here in part C. However, I already told you most of the things you need. Therefore, I think it's not hard for you to do the proof for yourself. So the proof is an exercise for you. Just put all the ideas I gave you now into formulas. Okay. With all these parts in mind, I can now go to the core of the proof. We now assume that we have a measure on the whole power set of the real line. And it also should fulfill the two properties we have given in the claim. And now we can use all the things above. For example, by our 
translation invariance to we can write that the measure mu of a uh, r n plus a is the same as the measure mu of a and this holds for all natural numbers n and maybe let us you see here immediately we know that the measure is always monotonic which means the measure of this set is less or equal than the measure of this set and this is less or equal than the measure of this set so we have exactly this inequality here we need it later again so i call the inequality here by star before we go further let us use now our second condition here that the measure of the unit interval is at least finite let us give this number a name so i write the measure of 0 1 equals to number and i call it just capital c with this we can indeed calculate the measure here we can use the properties of a measure namely the sigma additivity so i split the set into unit intervals or shifted unit intervals here i go to zero and include it and then i have a disjoint union when i exclude the zero here and go to one include it here again union one and here two Okay, and here we can now use the sigma additivity. Yeah, we can write this as measure of this set plus measure of this set plus measure of this set. And by using the translation invariance in two, you know all this measure have the same value, namely C. Hence we have C plus C plus C, so 3C. Okay, very good. Now I want to use this inequality I called star before. So this one, what you should see immediately now is that on the left we have C itself, but on the right we now calculated 3C. So let us write it down. So I have C less or equal than, and now I can use the sigma additivity as always, because this one is disjoint. Now this was part B from before. So I have now here the sum or the series from one to infinity of mu of a n and this is less or equal than 3 times c and now we also know that we can get rid of the n here uh, because here you see it this is a n so the translated version of a but the, by translation invariance we know the measure is the same so we can write mu of a on this case and I want to write that down as the important inequality here. So C less or equal the series of mu A and less or equal than 3C. So please look closely at this inequality. You see a fixed number mu of A in the middle and then the series. Then you know the series will explode. It gives you infinity if mu of A is greater than zero. So the only possible case when this is finite needs mu of a equals to zero and this is the case because we know that c is less than infinity so the series has to be convergent by this calculation we now can conclude that the measure of our set a has to be zero however this means now the value of the series is zero so we have zero in the middle and left and right we have c and 3c so there's also no other possible way other than c to be zero however remind yourself that c was just a short notation for the measure of the unit interval hence this measure is also just zero and indeed this helps us now calculating the measure of the whole real line just because I have translation invariance and sigma additivity. So we split the real line into unit intervals and shift them. So what we can do is you know, just use an interval starting with an integer m and then go to m plus 1. And if I use the union here, which is then a disjoint union, where m goes over all integers, I have what I want. Now I use sigma additivity and then translation invariance 
and then I get all also out, yeah, adding up zeros stays at zero. This now means that the volume or length of the whole real line measured in mu is just zero. So we are dealing with the trivial measure, the zero measure. And in fact, this is what we wanted to prove. And there we have it, the full proof how to see that the measure problem is not solvable. I know it was a long proof with a lot of technical details, but I hope you learned something here. And maybe I should close this proof with some interpretation of the whole thing. You saw that it is possible to construct such a set A where we can't have a reasonable length or measure. We would get contradictions if we are not dealing with the trivial zero measure. So the only possibility to deal with such sets that behave so strangely that we can't measure them is to exclude them from the beginning. We won't measure all possible subsets. We just deal with sets we then call the measurable sets. Now these are the sets that behave nicely enough such that we can solve the measure problem in this so-called sigma algebra then. In fact, the Boer sigma algebra you learned in part two of the series about is a correct choice to solve the measure problem. We will go into details about this in, in the future, but first in the next videos, I want to talk about maps that preserve our measurable structure here. So these are so-called measurable maps. Okay, then see you in the next video.